This lesson is an introduction to confidence intervals, and in particular we're going to be looking at the confidence intervals of sample proportions. Okay? Um, now, last video we looked at the distribution of sample proportions. That was in our video titled Sampling Distributions. Uh, we looked at two types of sampling distributions, the, sample, the distribution of sample proportions and the distribution of sample means. So today we're going to look specifically at sample proportions. And, and we're going to find out what a confidence interval is. Okay? So let's start by uh, remembering what we already know. That is, this is what a normal distribution looks like. It's centered around the mean, mu. And uh, here's one standard deviation away. Here's two standard deviations away. Okay? This is all old stuff. And then last time we found that the uh, distribution of the sample proportion p hat is normally distributed, centered at p, and the, uh, uh, the standard deviation of p hat is the square root of pq over n. Okay? So this is all stuff from before. And uh, we also know that 68% of our data fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of our data fall within about two standard deviations of the mean. And 99.7% of our data fall within about three standard deviations of the mean. And this is also true with our sample proportion p hat. So if we have, if we take a sample proportion, that sample proportion is going to look like this, centered around p, the population proportion, or the true proportion. Okay? So, let's go to the real world. Now, there's some proportion of Americans that favor the death penalty as the punishment for murder. And we're going to call that proportion p. Okay? That's our true proportion, our population proportion. What is P exactly? We don't know. That's the issue. Okay? We don't know what it is. So what do we do? Well, we take a survey. And as a matter of fact, the Gallup organization already did that for us. They went out and they polled 1,038 randomly selected adults, good for them for doing it randomly, and found that 654 of them responded that they favored the death penalty as a punishment for murder. 654. And 654 turns out to be 63% uh, of 1,038. So, that's our p-hat. That's our p-hat that corresponds to the one sample that we took. Now, had we taken a whole bunch of samples, we would have gotten a whole bunch of p-hats. And those whole bunch of p-hats would have fallen into this distribution, and, you know, we could take a whole bunch of them and make a dot plot or a histogram or something, and that dot plot or histogram is going to look like this, and it's going to be centered around P, our true proportion, which we don't know what it is, and it's going to be, and here's our standard deviation, which is going to be the square root of PQ over N. Again, we don't know what P is, so we're not sure exactly what that is. So uh, all we get, though, is we, get, we just get one shot. We just get this one. So instead of seeing this model and then being able to predict where p hat's going to fall, we don't see this model. All we see is p hat, and then we have to think, okay, now what's this model going to look like based on our one measurement of p hat? Okay? So, we start by saying there's a 95% probability that p hat is within 1.96 standard deviations of p. Uh, you'll notice that I've refined my uh, number of standard deviations. Uh, now that we're doing confidence intervals, we want to be a little more precise. And so 95% of our data falls within about two standard deviations, but more precisely, 1.96 standard deviations of the mean. Okay? So that's what we know. There's a 95% probability that p hat, any p hat, not the one that we took, but any p hat, is going to be within 1.96 standard deviations of p. So, since we get a measurement of p hat and we don't know what p is, we have to kind of reword this. And we'll say, we're 95% confident that p is within 1.96 standard deviations of p hat. Now, there's a difference in language that we're using here. We went from using 95% probability to 95% confident. Just go with me for a second, and then we'll look very much, uh, we'll look much more. Uh, uh, carefully at what that means in just a second. Okay? So instead of talking about how close p hat is to p, we're talking about how close p is to p hat. Alright? So 
our standard deviation is, as we know, the square root of PQ over N. We also looked at, last time, the standard error, which is an estimate of the standard deviation. It's P hat times Q hat over N, and it's very, very close to the standard deviation. So, why do we need the standard error? Well, because we don't know what P is. We do know what our measurement of P hat is. And so we can calculate a standard error that corresponds to our sample. We can't calculate the standard deviation. So, again, like I said, we're in the real world today. So let's, uh, let's stick with the standard error for now. So, back to our problem. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, the proportion of Americans that favor the death penalty as the punishment for murder. And we know that there was a survey that was done, and we calculated our p-hat. It's 63%. Now we can calculate our standard error. Okay, standard error is the square root of 0 0.63 times 0 0.37. Where'd that 0.37 come from? It's 1 minus 0 0.63. Okay, uh, divided by n. And when I did that, I got 0 0.015 or 1.5%. So, what does this mean? It means that we are 95% confident that P, our true proportion, is within... 1.96 times 0.015 of 0.63. All right, let's... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Where did the 1.96 come from? The 1.96 came from the number of standard deviations that 95% uh, that of our data is within. Okay? So, if 95% of our data fall within 1.96 standard deviations of the mean, that's where that came from. Okay? And since we're doing a 95% confidence interval, that's what we want to know. What, uh, what were that uh, 90? The number of standard deviations that correspond to 95%. Okay, where did the 0.015 come from? Right there. That's our standard error. And where did the 0.63 come from? Right there. That's our p hat. So, let's go back to the beginning for a second. To calculate a 95% confidence interval for the sample proportion, we start by saying there's a 95% probability that p hat is within 1.96 standard deviations of p. We then modify that statement slightly to say we're 95% confident that p, our true proportion, is within 1.96 standard errors of p hat. I threw standard errors in there because we can actually calculate that, uh, whereas we can't calculate the standard deviation. This next statement says the exact same thing except now I'm actually putting in my standard error there and I'm putting in my p hat. And so now I can say, okay, I am 95% confident that p is between uh, 0.63 minus 1.96 times uh, 0.015 and 0.63 plus 1.96 times 0.015, which tells me that I am 95% confident that the true proportion of Americans that favor the death penalty as a, as a punishment for murder is somewhere between 60.1% and 65.9%. Okay. Now, please don't say there is a 95% probability that P is between 0.601 and 0.659. Let me tell you why you don't say that. P, the true proportion, is a number. It is, it, is, it is not a random variable. So we don't talk about a probability of it being here or there. It's not a random variable. It's a number that is somewhere. The thing is, we just don't know what it is. But it is somewhere. It's not a variable. It's an unknown. Okay? So instead of saying that, say we are 95% confident that P is between 0.601 and 0.659. You know what is a random variable? P hat. You know what else is random? It's not p hat. It's not. It's not the, the the population parameter p. It's the interval that we're using to estimate p. Every time we take a sample, we'll get a different p hat, which will get us a slightly different interval. So we'll get this interval and that interval and that interval and that interval. And so what this means is, if we were to repeat this procedure indefinitely, the confidence interval would include the true population proportion 95% of the time. What's changing each time we do it? Not the true population proportion. That's the same every single time. It's the confidence interval that changes every single time we take a new sample, and then a new sample, and then a new sample. We get a slightly different confidence interval. And what this says is, 
95% of the time, that confidence interval will have the true proportion in it. 5% of the time, it won't. 5% of the time, it's going to be wrong. Okay? So, now would be a good time to hit the pause button and copy down this sentence. Because you need to know this sentence. Okay? This blue sentence here. Uh, now, our 95% conf confidence interval goes from p hat minus 1.96 times the standard error to p hat plus 1.96 times the standard error. What if we wanted a 90% confidence interval? Okay? So this time, 90% of the time we're going to be right and 10% of the time we're going to be wrong. Well, what we find is it's going to be slightly more precise. Okay? This number here is going to be a little bit smaller. Okay? So what we find is, if we can lower our confidence, we can actually get more precise. So if you look at your confidence interval and you say, oh, that's too wide, well, the only, there, you only have two ways of making your confidence interval more narrow, more precise. Either you can be less confident, meaning you'll be wrong more of the time, or you ask more people. Okay? You raise your N. Those are the only two ways to do it. Otherwise, if, if you want to be, if you want people to really, really trust you, that means you have to have a pretty high confidence level. You, you can't be wrong very often. Uh, so really, if you want people to trust you and you want to be precise, both, that N has just got to be pretty big. Alright? So, this is our 95% confidence interval. We use 1.96. Uh, here's our 90% confidence level. We use 1.645. And uh, where did we get those numbers? Well, those numbers are, uh, this, this is what we call critical values. And we frequently write them as Z star. Okay? Our, uh, and so Z star is our critical value. Uh, that is, uh, for 90%, it's 1.645. For 95%, it's 1.96. And it's the number of standard deviations away from the mean that hold, in this case, 90% of your data. In this case, 95% of your data. Okay? Uh, and so, so, so what are the components here? Here's your sample mean, and here's your sample proportion. This is your critical value. Here's your standard error, which is calculated by doing that. This stuff together, Z star times the standard error, is known as your margin of error. How far away, how far off it might be. Okay? So, um, let's, uh, oops, hold it, before I get to that, let's go back for a second. How do you calculate these numbers? Okay, think about it. Let's go up to the 1.96. 95% of our data fall within 1.96 uh, standard deviations of the mean. How can I find that out? Well, what I can think is, I can think, all right, I have my normal distribution, right? I'm thinking 95% of my data is inside of here, and then the, the other 5% lie in these little tails out here. So if I use the inverse normal function on my calculator, what I'll get is, I'll get all this piece up to here, okay? So what I want to ask, what I want to do on my uh, calculator is say, what's the inverse normal of not 95%, but 97.5%? Because 97.5% of my data is going to be less than the z-score of 1.96. It's going to be less than uh, two standard deviations, or 1.96 standard deviations above the mean. Here, to get a 90% confidence interval, I would look for the inverse normal function of 95%. Why is that? Because if I tell it 95%, it says, well, 95% of your data is going to be less than 1.645 standard deviations above the mean. Okay? Well, if 95% of the data is less than that, then that means I've got 5% over in this tail. Symmetrically, if I put 5% over in this tail, I'm going to have 90% of my data within 1.645 standard deviations of the mean. Okay, so the way that you uh, the way that you're going to calculate these numbers is take the confidence level that you have, 
subtract it from 100%, cut it in half, and then subtract that from 100% again. Okay? So, now let's go uh, back to uh, uh, our conditions. Okay? You always have conditions and assumptions. So, in order for this to work, first off, you have to have random sampling. We know what that is. Okay? There has to be a simple random sample or something really close to it. Secondly, plausible independence. And what that means is, uh, for example, in the, the, the example we just had, um, each of these people that we called, I'm, I can be fairly sure that one person's opinion about the death penalty is not going to affect another person's opinion about the death penalty. Not unless they were listening in on the prior conversation, and I don't think that Gallup uh, does things that way. Okay? So first off, you just think about the situation and you say, are these things going to be independent? Then, you have to do one more step about independence, and that is to, to look at the 10% condition. Okay? Uh, now, we had uh, uh, 1,038 people, I believe, in the sample that we looked at. That's okay, because we have over 300 million people in the U.S., and 1,038 is way less than 10% than of 300 million. And then, finally, is the normal model appropriate? And remember how to find if the normal model is appropriate or not? You look at NP and NQ. But hold it. We don't have P and Q. Oh my God, so what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use P hat and Q hat instead. Okay? And that's really easy to tell because you've taken your survey. Make sure that there's at least 10 responses on either side. That's going to be N times P and N times Q. Or, sorry, N times P hat and N times Q hat. So as long as you have at least 10 yeses and at least 10 noes in the survey that you've taken, your normal model's good. All right? And that's your confidence interval for the sample proportion p hat.